can tell you that firearms are very easily accessible in America, as we all know. Your family members can purchase one, and you're underage, you have access to it. Mine was not, you know, mine was not, the one that I used that day was not, uh, you know, purchased by me. It was not uh, something that I had readily access to. It was locked up, but I knew where the key was. And, you know, there was nothing, I mean, it's very difficult when we talk on the firearm and how to prevent these actions when we talk about people's rights to bear arms, people's possessions of firearms and how they get, you know, how many people have access to them. It's very difficult because my family went 100% the legal way. They, in fact, my mother had spoken with police before buying the weapon. My mother had spoken with my psychologist, my psychiatrist, and said, should he have access to this? Because I was doing better. I had sought out therapy. Like I said, I didn't open up all the way. I had opened up partially, and I, on the outside, was doing a lot better. And after a time, you know, I wanted to do hunting with some members of my family. And my mother made sure to ask my psychologist, my psychologist and my psychiatrist, is it okay for him to have access to a firearm? Do you believe he's a danger to himself and others? I said, no, he's, he's not. He's not a danger. My mother spoke with the police and said, hey, I have a 16-year-old son. Is it okay for him to have, you know, this in the household if he does want to go shooting with his father or with his brothers? Is he allowed to do that? What is the rules with that? Because she didn't know. So again, that's why when we talk about firearms, that can be a very difficult subject. That's why my focus is more on the mental health aspects. As difficult as that is, that is something that I believe is so much easier. It shouldn't be uh, a political issue. Mental health is not a political issue. Everybody should believe that more access is needed. <coughs> Quality access is needed. Affordable access is needed. Especially for the young. Especially for children. If you don't believe in, in you know, mental health access for all, can we at least say mental health access for children? Can we provide that for them? Can we give them a place and an opportunity to seek help? I come from a home where my father left when I was a very young man, I mean a very young child. But I do have support from my family. I did have support. Unfortunately, I left them in the dark. And even when there were certain things going on when I was truant, when I was skipping school, uh, classes and skipping school. The school did sometimes reach out to my family, but again, because I was the quiet one that wasn't raising red flags, I wasn't becoming a problem, I wasn't in there um, creating a disturbance, I quietly slipped through class. And yeah, they reached out to my family, but not always. We had as far as security, I think we had, we had one officer that would sometimes be on school as a D.A.R.E. officer. I don't know whether or not he was there that day. I don't really, to be honest, I don't know what the security in that fashion was at that school. Um, but we did have an officer present at, at certain times who would reach out, who would interact with students, and was helpful. We often feel as kids that we're alone, that other people don't understand our pain, so I think that's one of the key things that we can be doing is to be providing them with people who are able to open up to them first so that they feel comfortable with opening up themselves. In the early 2000s, there was no social media. Uh, <laughs> um, but I understand that that can be a key for, for people to look at nowadays um, and to be concerned when somebody is raising issues on social media, when somebody is possibly showing red flags or even making possible threats. Um, and again, it is a very fine line where it might be somebody who is showing those red flags that somebody that needs help. Uh, and again, I know everybody here wants our kids to be safe, wants our schools to be safe. Well, I can't help but also look at those kids who are making those threats and wonder how can we best approach them and help them? How can we respond to their basically cries of help, even though they're making terrible threats. They are threatening to do something horrible. And we want to prevent them from being able to go through with that. But we
we also want to work with them so that they can go on with the rest of their lives and become more healthy emotionally so that they never feel that need to reach out, to lash out, to threaten again. But the key point for me, at least, in turning my life around has been all the people who are willing to reach out to me with compassion instead of hatred. And I'll tell you, for me, I know that might sound weird, but that hurt me even more when people would reach out to me and offer to help me after I'd done something so horrible. Uh, but so I think that that's something that we can look at, uh, and that's why I use the word compassion a lot, because that's something that again and again I look back on the years uh, of my incarceration, and trust me, prison is not a compassionate place. And there was very few people, usually on the outside world, who would reach out to me, who were willing, complete and total strangers, were willing to write to me and to offer a safe place where I could write back to them, where they were willing to help me out in whatever fashion they were able to. So how can we prevent others from doing this? How can we help other people, like you said, kind of release the anger is even when people are angry, even when people are lashing out, the most difficult thing to do is to show them compassion. To a certain degree, it's needed. To a certain degree, yes, you need to make sure that they are unable to hurt other people or themselves. But if you can do that, if you can prevent them from hurting people, to do so with an open heart at the same time, if you can manage to find that, then you can change their lives, and you can change the lives of the people around them. You can prevent them from possibly hurting other people. You can not only prevent the harm that they'll cause others, but you will make them a better person. And I know it's difficult. I know it sounds like such a high uh, thing to aim for, but that's what I believe we should be aiming for. John, thank you for... So I'll say this, is that um, as I was suffering in depression, your view of reality becomes distorted. People, I had plenty of people in my life who cared about me, who supported me, who loved me. I had people who were reaching out to me. Um, and that's why when I talk about all these ways that we can prevent things, it's very difficult because in my mind, I distorted a lot of their care, a lot of their concerns. I went into an episode where I basically thought that their care for me, their concern for me, was actually a distrust for me. I started to believe that they're talking to me like this because they don't believe that I'll ever change. They don't believe I'll ever be trustworthy of living on my own life. I don't believe that I'll ever be able to live a good life. And that's why it's so hard to help people. Is sometimes we have to realize we have to keep pushing because when somebody isn't in that right mindset, when somebody isn't in that right psychological standpoint, they're going to distort what you do in their own minds. That's why it's so difficult when you show somebody some compassion, when you show somebody some love, and you're trying to help them. In their minds, they might see that as an attack. They might see that as you not trusting them, not wanting to help them, but the complete opposite of what your intentions are. And that's why it's so hard. 